Welcome to Shenandoah National Park. This is the sixth in our series of virtual wildflower walks. I'm Kristen Zimmet. I'm a volunteer for the park. I am a guest naturalist today from the Virginia Native Plant Society's Piedmont chapter. We're going to walk today down Mill Prong Trail. And a prong is the same as a creek or a branch that feeds into a larger body of water. Uh, and we will be first parallel to Mill Prong itself, and then it will get closer and closer, and the terrain will get damper and damper, and it will cross the trail in a few places. As we go down the hill from 3,200 feet, several be, we'll wind up several hundred feet lower, and so we'll be several hundred feet deeper into spring. It will also get warmer because it will be lower elevation. It will get wetter because we'll be closer to Mill Prong. And it will be also further and further from the uh, effects of human disturbance on the landscape. So as you can imagine, the plants that grow along the trail, our native plants, will shift. Let's go see. We've got an oven bird calling. That's a ground nesting bird, so it's very glad that the cover of native plants is increasing for it to nest in. So one wonderful thing when you're looking at native plants is you don't just enjoy plants that are flowering. You have the chance to see the stars, the next stars waiting in the wings to come out and shine. The plants that will be the next ones to take center stage. And so here we have a beautiful colony of Turk's cap lily. And we've got some of them that are very young first-year plants. Just a single leaf comes up. And we have some that are older and get a few leaves. And then you begin to see the characteristic whorls around the stem, like a pinwheel. And in older plants, a few years older probably, than the first one we looked at. You can see a second story. When this plant has had its full number of years of growth, it's going to be our most extravagant lily. It's going to be up over my head and it's going to branch and it could have as many as 40 individual lilies this size branching off a single plant. And what lilies? They are orange, they are freckled, and their petals stretch up behind their faces all the way until they meet. So now you know there are six petals and sepals together on lilies. And so if you have six of them meeting overhead, you have a kind of Turk's cap. That's what the name is. In the front, in the flower face now, the petals have stretched way far back, like, look at me, look at me, pollinators. Come here, and sticking out of the middle come white stamens, long ones with purple tips. Uh, so it's showy both above and below. And the other marvelous thing is that each petal has a little triangle of pale 
green against the orange. So put those triangles all together, six of them remember, and you get a six-pointed star, a six-pointed green star in the middle of a Turk's cap lily flower. So this is a plant to very much look forward to in maybe two or three weeks time. I will say though, that there's a chance that you and other humans aren't the only ones coming to look at the Turks cap lilies. The deer are keeping their eye on them too. It is just possible this year that you'll come to see the lilies in bloom and discover they have been a deer's lunch. And that's all right. That's the balance of nature. Let's see. Ah. So we're stopping here chiefly to admire the hay scented fern coming up and it's come up very fast in the last few days. And hay scented fern is soft looking. In fact, it's covered with soft white hairs, but it is one of the toughest ferns I know. And I'll tell you why. First of all, imagine trying to come up through rack and just push your way up. And now imagine that you're just a little green thing, pitting yourself against rock. Well, the way most ferns do it, and hay fern, hay scented fern does also, is it sort of forms a fist. It curls itself tightly and pushes up through the rocks, and then it uncurls. So you'll see at the top of each one of these, there's still a very tight fist curled. It hasn't quite finished unfolding. So that's the first tough thing it has to do. The second thing has to do with these soft looking white hairs that stick straight out, straight out at 90 degree angles from the stem. And pretty as they are, they're also doing something you wouldn't expect. The end of each one, the tip of each one is a gland and the gland is putting out a chemical and the chemical is saying to all the plants that might want to share the understory with it, don't come too close to me. This is my ground. Uh, so it's, it's a, a chemical warning sign that it's posting. And as if that wasn't enough, it's hard to tell here because we have so many ferns interacting with themselves, but with, with each other. Um, but hay-scented fern has an underground stem, like almost all ferns, a rhizome, and it puts down roots, runs along, puts down roots, and has another frond. Hay-scented makes a good long distance between fronds. So you might find this one as the first, this one as the second, this one as the third, it covers a lot of ground with that, this is mine message. It's what you call a long creeping fern. There are of course a few plants that are paying no attention to the message here. There's, um, let's see, oh yes there is. There's a little bit of elderberry starting to come up despite it. And I think I saw a little bit of our native chickweed also flowering here in the midst of it, but mostly, by and large, everything is respecting the hay-scented fern, the small but tough. Ferns, most ferns, have a very endearing fact. You meet one, you turn it over on its back, and on its backside, you can see the uh, packages in which the spores are stored. And it's hard to see right now, although the primordia for it are there. But hay scented is going to have the most original spore cases of all. I just love them. So a little bit of tissue rises up and makes a cup. 
and then packages of spores, we call them sori, looking like tiny little eggs occupy the center. So for all the world, when you turn over a mature hay-scented fern, you're going to think you've got miniature bird's nests. The other way that you can be sure it's hay-scented fern is if you were just to take the tiniest bit of it and rub it on your palm where there's some warmth and some friction and then smell it. And it does smell like hay. It smells like fresh vanilla. So you'll never forget hay-scented fern. So here is a plant that's in its glory right now. And we get a branch low enough for you to enjoy. This is hawthorn. And you'll always know a hawthorn by these amazing curving thorns coming out of the nodes. You might see them short and stubby. You might see them long and thick or long and thin. These are exceptionally thin, but they're all hawthorns if you see that curved thorn. Uh, the reason there are so many kinds of them is that plants, unlike animals, are not so limited in how they reproduce. Plants can do hybrids between species with great ease. Plants can double up on their chromosomes. Plants can sometimes reproduce without a partner at all. So there are possibly 200 kinds of hawthorns. Hawthorn is in the rose family and it might surprise you, A, that plants have families, and B, that you could be a flower or a tree and still in the same family. You can see, if you look at the lovely flowers, on the back of each one, the sepals form a star, and that's one of the hallmarks of the rose family. I love about hawthorns that the stamens are purple against the white. Hawthorns have a story to tell, especially in England. They're both in this country and in Europe. And in England, long ago, all the public land, the, all the, the grazing lands were public. And people held great swaths of land in common. Now we have national parks, but most of our lands are carved up into private ownership. When that started to happen in England, they said, oh, we have to mark whose field is whose field. And what did they use? They used hawthorn because it had thorns, so it made a good hedge and H-A-W, haw, meant hedge in English at that time. Uh, and they were beautiful too, and fast growing, and thick growing. And so if you go to England, in the, in the countryside right now, you would see the fields all marked off by flowering hawthorns, just like this one, or a relative of this one. And people would go as they did back in the Middle Ages, would go Maying to gather hawthorn and strew it to celebrate the month of May. Ah. So here is a shrub or a low tree, that's about as tall as it gets there, that practically owns the understory at this elevation. You look all around you and here it is. This is choke cherry or bitterberry. Not very tender names, but this is a very good and giving plant. And you can already see some of the gifts it's giving. 
There are freshly laid butterfly or moth eggs on it. There are holes chewed by butterflies or moths. In fact, there are at least 20 species that it hosts. And that's just for starters before it even flowers. So here's a, an inflorescence just beginning, a flower head. There are some that are in full bloom higher up where there's more sunshine already. When this becomes in fruit, it has the same shape, and you'll see that more than other cherries, it has an elongated flower stalk. And when it comes into fruit, it lives up to its name. You could choke on it. It's bitter. In fact, it's even kind of wrinkly, like it wouldn't look like something you'd want at all to eat, whether you were a bird or a human. But give it a while, let each of those berries mature the seed deep inside it, and by early fall, it's sweet. And that's when the migrating birds need it. And that's when the birds that will stay for the winter and want to bulk up need it. So choke cherry, bitter berry, does a good turn for the forest and all its creatures. You can recognize it by these tiny, tiny teeth along the edge. And where it grows in fuller sun, there's often an, a red outline around the edge and a reddish little stalk that each leaf comes out on. And you can also recognize it by another thing that it hosts, which is black knot fungus. And you can see that in some places, it's actually the black knot has killed the choke cherry or is starting to. But there's plenty to go around because choke cherry reproduces not only by flowers and fruits, but by suckering. And that's one secret to its vast success here. Blue, there's black. All right, this is my spot. Ah, here's a plant that's full of surprises, growing abundantly. This is black cohosh. And the first surprise about black cohosh is the family it's in. Plants have families, and like in your family, not everybody looks alike. This is a plant in the buttercup family. Surprisingly enough, it looks nothing like a buttercup in its size, in its, the color of its flower, in almost anything, but it is, genetically speaking. So that's surprise number one. Surprise number two is that as how much black there is, this has already come up a little way. Let's see, ah. When it's um, just coming out of the ground, it has a lot of black color in it, which is a really kind of unusual color in nature for, for a plant. Um, and then it becomes this shiny green with a new foliage unfolding in its three parts. Three, one, two, three, then one, two, three, one, two, three. Each node divides three ways. So plants can count. That might be a surprise to you. Uh, the next surprise is when it flowers. Here it is in fairly dark, fairly shady woods. And so you hardly notice it in the gloom later in the, maybe in, in August. But it puts up this tall spike, so it's actually often over my head and it's covered with starry white flowers and that gives rise to its marvelous name. It gleams pale against the dark shadows and it's called fairy candles or fairy wand as one of its common names. 
So another surprise is what happens to those fairy wands. Each of the flowers becomes what is a seed pod, a dry seed pod, and it looks for all the world like a beetle shell with ridges on it. And if you shake it in August, it rattles. It makes the most satisfying rattle. And those dry seeds, when the, when the pod splits, are going to burst and propagate itself. But the last and most wonderful thing about black cohosh is that it's an herb that has been of great service to women. And that's both in the cultures of the first peoples here in the Americas and in the cultures of the European settlers who came. And midwives discovered that this is full of estrogen. In fact, if you have hot flashes, today many people take an extract of black cohosh. And it's growing, I am delighted to say, very close to another plant that people confuse with it all the time. And I am just thrilled that I get to show you both of them, one against the other. So let's look at blue cohosh. And notice that it has a sort of blue cast to this green. If you were an artist in mixing paints, you definitely want to mix some blue in with your green. Even the more so, a purplish blue here on the young stalk, see? And the leaves, which are also in threes, have this rabbit's foot look that is so distinctive. Nothing at all like the look of the black cohosh. This is blue cohosh. It has the bluish color and it has this rabbit's foot design of the leaf. And it has very, very different flowers. Remember I talked about that long fairy candle? Well, here is blue cohosh in flower. And it's rather unusual. The petals are brown, maybe a tinge of purple in the brown, but absolutely nothing to draw the eye. We're used to thinking of flowers as showy. Um, and that's because in our gardens, flowers are generally cultivated to enlarge the flowers, to deepen the colors. But here in nature, this is quite good enough for the pollinators, especially because on each petal, there are tiny glands that you might need a magnifying glass to see, but which are producing a little bit of nectar for the small pollinators that come and love it. Blue cohosh is also a woman's herb, historically, uh, and it has been used for a very different purpose. It has been used to induce uterine contractions, and you can imagine there are times when that is medically very important. So you have now seen black cohosh, and blue cohosh. And you'll never confuse them again. So here is a plant we just can't pass by. This is the cow parsnip, a rather inelegant name for a gentle giant. You probably have seen it as you've been going down the Skyline Drive, if you're up here in person. And it gets a bad rap sometimes because other members of its family have a very dangerous chemicals. It's okay to touch this one unless you happen to be extra sensitive and then the chemicals on it may interact with sunshine and you won't be happy. But that's how the plant protects itself from us because we are the dangerous ones in the world of the plant. So the cow parsnip, as I said, is a gentle giant. It's grown, it's about doubled in size in the last week. It will wind up being possibly 10 feet tall. So these darling little folded up cabbage leaves are gonna open out immensely. And the bloom stalk 
itself is just formidable. It, you, you could have, it, it, it opens like an umbrella and you could have as many as 30 spokes to the umbrella and each of the spokes has maybe as many as 30 more spokes on it. So you might have as many as 90 flowers on a single giant blossom. So you can imagine what a feast this is. And so birds that are looking for nourishment also resort to the dried seed stalk. So it's a very giving, gentle giant. Its name in science also reflects its size. You know that plants have both common names, which sometimes get changed from place to place or thrown around from one plant to another, the same name. So they're a little imprecise, although they're colorful. And then plants have scientific names so that the whole scientific community knows when they're talking about a plant, they're talking about the same plant. So in Latin, the scientific name is, ready? Heraclium maximum. So you got the maximum part, right? Heraclium is for Heracles, who was this larger than life hero in Greek mythology, who could do extraordinary tasks. And uh, this is a larger than life plant. So here we are with another big beauty. And you could use this plant to know where the ground is the wettest all around. It is a lover of wet places. So this particular patch must be where the water runs you can also almost map the hydrology on this trail by following the false hellebore. It's a terrible name, and I hope you're going to come up with a better common name than false anything, because it's, it's a real, true, wonderful native. The thing that I am sure that you notice is the deep, deep pleating of the leaves how ribbed they are, and you, almost as if you carefully ironed every one of them. And this water lover has a special reason for its spiral, and that is, imagine that it's raining, and the water runs all the way down the first one. It becomes a sort of fountain through successive ones of the leaves. The water runs down the stalk to its own roots it doesn't lose a drop of rain that falls on it. This plant, like many plants, speaks the language of chemicals and it needs to keep itself safe. These eye-catching leaves, you know, surely attract the attention of anything that is grazing. And so there were times when the settlers in this area would have cattle and horses, and they would, when other forage ran out, have to resort to eating false hellebore. Well, false hellebore protects itself against predation the best it can, and the best it can is to be loaded with alkaloids. So if an animal is forced to nibble on it, it will get very sick, what they call the staggers. But we're not going to nibble it. We're going to admire it. In a couple of weeks when you come back, you couldn't see me over the top of this. And it will put up a bloom stalk, which has the most bizarre green big star flowers. This is false hellebore. And when you figure out the right name for it that's complimentary, please let me know. All right, so I have shown you some very large plants. And now we're going to go to something very dainty. We've been seeing as we've walked along the trail a lot of these single leaves. This is Canada Mayflower. And it has an amazing story to tell, both in space and in time. You heard me say, Canada right? 
So that is a long way from Virginia. There was a time when all the Canada Mayflowers were up in Canada, and that was before the last ice age. That was about 12,000 years ago. Um, when the climate began to shift, all of the plants and animals that could began to shift their ranges. And they came south, those that survived came down from Canada all the way down. The, the ice sheet extended to the middle of Pennsylvania and many Canadian plants were right here. Well, 10,000 years ago, when the ice age came to an end and gradually everything warmed up again, the plants and animals who could went back north again. But some of the plants instead came to high elevations because of course it's colder up here. It's in fact 10 degrees colder up here routinely when I come up to the park than, than where I live down in the Shenandoah Valley. So the plants and animals that stayed came to as high an elevation as they could. So here is Canada Mayflower. And there's another time story to be told here. You see mostly the single leaf that is the beginning, the first thing that comes and nourishes the root. And it may be years before the root feels well enough nourished that it's ready to put up two leaves or possibly three. And that's the most that this little plant will do. So here is a plant with a two. When there's two, there's enough nutrition to afford to make flowers. And here is the delicate little bloom stalk. It's a tiny little plume of flowers, about as big as my little fingernail. And it's beautiful. It's a relative of Solomon's seal and Solomon's plume, if you've seen them. And the third thing that this plant does about timing is that as close together as these little flowers are, it doesn't want to pollinate itself. And so the flowers take turns. So first the bottom ones flower, and then the next one's up, and then the next one's up. And the top flower always goes last. Canada Mayflower, and you'll only see it at the high elevations. It's a special plant for us in the park. So here is a beautiful fern that I'm excited to be able to show you. You can see it a lot as you uh, drive down the Skyline Drive at this time of year especially. You see the fresh green and then you see all of a sudden this dark spot along the front. So this is interrupted fern and it is perfectly well named. It comes up in this vase shape with this tan, woolly, protective substance on it, which it sheds. And some of the leaves come up and all they're gonna do is nourish the plant. They're gonna photosynthesize. But the leaves in the center have two jobs to do. One is to make food, make food, made food, made food, made food, made food make more ferns. So the fertile stalks, the fertile fronds, share the stalk with the vegetative fronds. They interrupt it. In a couple more weeks, it's going to be much taller, much fuller. In fact, it's going to be so full that birds like the yellow warbler who are ground nesting can hide themselves in their nest in it. And these 
fertile leaflets, which are just loaded, loaded, loaded down with spores, will have dispersed them and will have shriveled away to nothing. And then you will have fern, 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 fern. Interruption, fern. It's in the royal fern family. And each member of the royal ferns has a curious place in which to put its fertile leaves. Well, I've gone off trail, and I'm not going to tell you exactly where, because this is a plant that there are few of, and they're extremely special to us. But I want you to enjoy looking at the yellow lady slipper, probably the fanciest flower we're going to see today. It's, uh, it loves it to be damp, it loves it to be on limestone, and it needs one more thing to be here. And that's an invisible thing, but super important to the forest. Yellow lady slippers seeds aren't like the usual plant seeds you think of, that have some substance to them and have nourishment in them for the developing embryo inside the seed. No, yellow lady slipper orchid seeds are like a little grain of dust. It's nothing but genetic material and an envelope of a little bit of oil to keep it from drying out. So it means that you can make many, 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 many more, a whole dust of the seeds. On the other hand, it means that they're not coming equipped with what they need to survive. So when an orchid seed falls to the forest floor, what receives it is a fungus that grows here, a special kind of fungus that welcomes the seed, that feeds the seed, and is continuing to nurture it even now when the plant has grown tall enough to have new seeds of its own. Pretty amazing. What's even more amazing is that this same fungus may also be attached to trees and other plants all around us. So you would never, ever want to dig up a yellow lady slipper or any other of our native orchids for that matter, because they are so intimately bonded to the community in which they grow. And unless you took the whole earth with you, it wouldn't thrive. The flower, of course, is an amazing construction. It's called sometimes Venus's shoe or Whippoorwill shoe, and you can see just why. Or any, anybody who calls it a slipper is imagining how a foot would slip right into there. This is actually one of the six petals that is grown into this marvelous lip into which an insect goes. It's covered up by a sepal, special structure, and it, so it is guided both by the sepal and by stripy lines inside to make sure that it goes exactly where it has to go to pollinate. In fact, there are little brushes here along these side petals that also make sure to keep the insect focused where it needs to be to pollinate. And of course, the glory of this flower too is these twirly, twisty side petals. We've got petal, 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 sepal, sepal, sepal. And the marvelous twist on this particular orchid is that I can see that there's a crab spider that has taken up residence right in the hairs of the side petal. And it's waiting for an insect to come along to pollinate, and then it's going to get its supper. Everything in nature works together. So we've come now as far as we're going to be able to go today, and we've come to 
a perfectly enchanting plant to end with. We began the walk, you may recall, with the lily that is the biggest and showiest. And here is the lily that is the most delicate, the least extroverted of them all, the shyest, and maybe the one I love best. It's very unusual to find. We find it down where it's wet, here where the mill prong crosses the mill prong trail and in very few other places in the park. And this is called Rose Twisted Stalk. And why is it Twisted Stalk? Well, first of all, if you look from above and follow the stem, you'll see it goes zigzag, zigzag, zigzag from one leaf node to the next. No matter which of the branching parts you follow. But there's another reason. And that you only find out when you lift it up. Because hidden beneath are these beautiful little pink lilies. Slightly recurved. So the petals splay open. And each one of them is on a stalk that twists around so it'll hang down and be hidden. Or sometimes it actively kinks. So let's say one of these is kinky and one of these is twisty. And this is really unusual. I am so glad that you're getting to see it. I hope you will come walk the Milpong Trail so that you can see it for yourself and all the beauties that we haven't been able to talk about on this stretch and well beyond. I hope you enjoy the native wildflowers as much as I do.